let's work on this little recording king here. I like recording kings. I know, I know. They cost less than a steak dinner at Delmonico's. But they're cheap and cheerful, rather than cheap and disappointing, in most cases. I think they embody the spirit of the guitars that they're trying to copy better than a lot of the stuff, sort of, a few price points up the ladder. And I like the way they sound. Buster Scruggs played one. That's one of my favorite movies, actually. The Coen Brothers film from a few years ago. Tim Blake Nelson comes riding in with his uh, white horse and his shiny duds on, and he's strumming one of these, and it looks the part. You know, it's right out of fictional 1930s. It evokes something. And yes, they often have issues with getting the action exactly where I want it, because um, the tail pieces may be a bit too flexible for the neck angle and things. I usually make them work. The owner of this one has it tuned down to C, like C standard, like a baritone guitar, and it sounds fantastic. We're going to electrify it with uh, one of these Recording King gold foil pickups. Haven't worked with one of these yet. It's inexpensive. It's a $50 pickup. So we'll see what it does. This is kind of your standard passive pickup arrangement. It's got the usual strap jack and this thing that clamps into the sound hole. We need to figure out the situation at the tail end here. The options are to remove the strap button, remount the hole in the tailpiece, drill through the block, and make it the way you'd expect to see it. However, there are no screws in this tailpiece, um, so this is the only thing that's holding it in place. And the position of the hole is such that, um, you know, we're going to have to ream it, remove quite a bit of material. I'd, I'd want to measure to make sure there's enough left. You know, we'd be just relying on the little washer on the jack to hold it all together. Unless I put some gold screws in there, which I, I have a few that I can donate to the cause. That might be the way to go. The other option is to put it under the tailpiece um, and have the jack separate, which might look a little funny, but it works. I've done it several times in the past. Yeah, I'm thinking I do have those little gold screws, so putting it through the strap button position is probably the cleanest solution. I think there's enough material there to make it work. Oh, just so we're clear, this is the Justin Towns Earl model, not the dirty 30s. Like I say, stringing these can be a bit hit and miss. Um, this one's got the resonator style tailpiece on it. Uh, there's another one which is hinged, like a standard trapeze, and those ones, it really doesn't work. There's not enough brake angle. These ones are okay if you understring it, like you see here with the ball ends of the strings on the top side, have them go under. Um, you need the extra half inch or so to get you enough brake angle. We'll have a look at the instructions here. Doesn't seem like there's anything out of the ordinary. Um, it's nice that they tell you to drill a 15 30 seconds hole, which is a drill bit that very few people have unless they're into woodworking. But it's the right drill size. A lot of these say half inch, and that hole is too large for these things. Uh, there can be problems with a half inch hole. So that's good. I think I know what I'm doing. Putting the jack through the tailpiece means this has to be a multi-part operation. I need to keep the tailpiece centered because if it slips a little bit in either direction it's going to mess up the position of the strings on the fretboard. They might not line up where I want them and be too close to the edge. So first I'll pull this off, drill the screw holes, um, put it back on, mark them on the body, drill for them, as well as drill and make sure there's a centered pilot hole where the screw is now. Take it all off again, ream out the hole in the tailpiece so that it'll accept the jack, make sure it aligns with the hole in the body, then progressively drill that hole larger and ream it to fit. Simple. I want the screw holes to be biting into the side, not the binding, so I want them to come down a little bit somewhere around there, and uh, I'll make the other one pretty similar. Uh, seven and a half millimeters from the edge. And almost exactly ten millimeters down. And this guy I can just sort of eyeball in the center. 
marking some center points. As you might expect, this only looks like it's made of solid brass. It's really plated steel. My screws have flat heads, so I'm going to countersink. With the tailpiece back on, I'll mark the positions with an awl. I'll use the original screw hole to center a drill bit of the exact same diameter, so I know I'll be concentric. Got my step drill here, and uh, I've marked out for the half inch increment. I'm going to drill to the 7 16 the one prior to that, which gives me uh, a little bit of room to ream to fit. Inexpensive tapered reamer. We call a repairman's reamer. Go from both sides because there's going to be um, kind of a dimple of material built up around the circumference where it exited. This is a cello end pin reamer. To capture the jack and fish it through the hole, I can either use this quarter inch dowel, sometimes I use this uh, piece of wire that has a chunk of jack on the end of it. Fish that on through. Uh, making sure that I have both the washer and the little spiked washer as well. Those are important. Okay, fish that through, and I can see now that uh, there's too much of the barrel exposed. The larger diameter threads are on the outside. I want those recessed just ever so slightly. So when I put on the retaining nut, it all you know, tightens up smoothly. And I'm not going to end up with, um, for instance, so much of the barrel inside the uh, strap button that it's hard to get a jack in. And uh, not so much exposed that uh, I can't tighten this up and the jack is prone to turning uh, loosely. So, we'll go back inside here, of course, and give that nut a turn or two, and try it again. Just a little more. Okay, that looks good. Give it a tug and see where it ends up. I think that'll tighten up nicely. So now I can put the retaining washer and screw on. To tighten this up I've got this old broken drill bit which is smooth and isn't gonna wreck the threads in there. Uh, there's a hole through the barrel of the jack that goes in there and find the correct is it actually going to be 12 millimeters? Hard to tell sometimes. Yes, 12 millimeters. Metric. See that was almost there. I gotta take this off and uh, go back and loosen it approximately half a turn because um, this jack can rotate slightly with extra pressure. I'll use my soft jaw pliers here just to give this a little tweak at the end and really snug that up. You can see that the barrel of the jack is about flush with the uh, end of the strap button. Okay, I vacuumed out all the little bits and pieces that end up inside when you drill and now I get to position the pickup. This one relies on simple spring tension to hold it in place rather than screw mechanisms that you'll find on certain other kinds. This is not unlike the old dearmament pickups, which to be honest can sometimes mar the surface on the inside definitely and sometimes on the outside too. Um, 
Some even have little spikes that stick into the soundboard to keep them from shifting, which is an idea that we've done away with over the years, hopefully. In this case, there's um, a plastic binding around the circumference of the hole here, and that'll keep things from getting too chewed up. What this didn't come with are wire clips, and I think it needs at least one. Um, some people are more sensitive to the sensation of loose wires than others, you know, but it's nice to kind of lock it down and prevent that knocking sound when you move the guitar around. Oh, these little tiny 30s guitars, small sound holes. Ow! Sharp! This guy simply slips in place here. That rests on the other side. You're trying to get it uh, reasonably even. I'm trying to position these cutouts in the uh, top plate with the uh, edge of the fingerboard. So things will be pretty symmetrical. And then I just gotta push this guy back around. Okay, so that's pretty sturdy. It's not going anywhere. Okay, I think that's all right. Doesn't look too out of place. You know, some guitars elicit a kind of uh, visceral auditory memory. They sound like a particular song, and this one, to me, immediately brings up this old blues called The Last Kind Word by a singer named Gishi Wiley. 1930s recording, early 30s. Up until about like 15 years ago, the only way people knew that song was if they'd watched um, Terry Zwigoff's documentary about Robert Crumb, the comic artist. I think it was in his collection of 78s, and there's a scene in which he pulls it out, puts it on, and listens to it while they go perusing through his uh, sketchbooks. And the first time I saw that movie, I was like, what is that? I need that. But this was pre-Napster pre-any music stuff on the internet. This is like 1995, 94. You could never find it at that point. It was simply, it wasn't available. There was like three copies in the world. So there was no way. But it just burned a hole in me. And this guitar sounds like that, somehow. You'll note that I've woven a piece of paper towel between the strings here. Might swap that out for a bit of cotton rope or something more romantic. Or get one of those rubber mutes because um, this guitar has some sort of buzzy behind the bridge action here, the after length, which um, is on the borderline of annoying. So I've got that muted. <laughs> Plugged in, just a hint of single coil hum, which is kind of what makes it authentic. Even string to string. Just a hint of the kind of resonator tone, which I find very pleasant. talk about nuts. Brass nuts, specifically. What's the deal with brass? They had a short-lived interval of prominence in the late 1970s, early 80s. Why was that? Well, I think, ostensibly, it was about sustain. Particularly in electrics, of course. You know, if you're in a Boston cover band, you want to hit that soaring note in more than a feeling, and you don't want it to crap out on you halfway. It's no good. Uh, metal is so dense it won't soak up any of that valuable sound. Is that true? Yes, if you believe it to be true. Could you prove it, though? Maybe if you have an, an echoic chamber and an array of sensors and a way to excite the string with the same pressure every single time, you could map out the decay of notes and figure out what material 
promotes more sustain. Um, but of course there are other things that go into that equation. You know, there's the amount of magnetic pull on the pickups, um, things like the scale length, uh, the bridge attachment system to the guitar, has it got, you know, a whammy bar or something on it. Then there's the composition of the saddle material. Um, also the composition of the string, you know, that all comes into it. The frets even. Uh, and is the string open or is it fretted? You know, that's all before you get to the amp, which is, you know, a whole other can of worms. But yes, playing around with the material a nut is made with um, can be fun and profitable. Are plastic nuts bad? Are the bone nuts good? Are ivory nuts better? Uh, are synthetic ivory nuts somewhere in between? You know, you have to make your own opinions on this. Or figure out who you're going to listen to. This is an Eastman... I'm not sure if this one was in a video or not. Um, I think it was. You can't expect me to remember. People will occasionally ask me about a point from a video I made four years ago, and it's like, you know, it's like me asking you what you had for lunch on a specific day in 2018. You know, there were a lot of lunches in that year. The owner of this guitar wears out the G-string nut slots in his guitars. He also breaks a lot of G-strings. Why? Uh, he plays in drop tunings with a thumb pick and, you know, with a wound G-string. Plus it's sorcery. But he likes the sound of brass. Uh, he occasionally switches out the bridge pins in his acoustic guitars for brass pins and contends that that has a positive effect on the sound. So we're going to try and kill two birds and replace the bone nut in this guitar with a brass one and see if it lasts longer for him. Um, interestingly, the nylon nuts that Gibson used in the 50s and 60s seem to last better than a lot of seemingly harder materials. So who really knows what's going on? If you go looking around online, you can buy pre-slotted brass nuts. Just not for this guitar. The ones out there are all a millimeter and a half too narrow for this one. So I had to go out and buy myself a billet of solid brass. It's not inexpensive stuff. Um, and make sure you get the right kind. Use the wrong brass and you'll sacrifice half the tone. You think it's just copper and zinc, don't you? No, -uh. There's over 60 different kinds of brass out there. This happens to be C360, which is basically what every single metal supplier will sell you if you go looking for brass. I don't think there's going to be too much of a difference. Yeah, it's funny. Nut slots seem to be just fine for all of them, except when you get to the G-string. It's lying on top of the fret there. You hear that little bit of a lisp. Little buzzy thing. Goes away when you press the first fret. So, that is the defining characteristic of a nut slot that's too low. So aftermarket nuts probably wouldn't have worked for this anyway because Eastman has um, done a Martin style angled slot. So the bottom of the nut follows the headstock angle rather than the neck angle. So we'll measure the old nut and that seems to be 235 thousandths which is six millimeters. Kind of to be expected in an Asian guitar. And I've purchased quarter-inch material here, so we should have some room to play. And we don't. <laughs> Those funny guys in that multinational mail-order type business. Yeah, this is 238 thousandths. So, very little room to spare. Oh well, we'll make it work. I'll measure the nut width. Which is... Hmm, one and three quarters. A suspiciously American sounding increment. Oh well. Which would be about 44 and a half millimeters. No, I don't have a 6,000 pound Bridgeport mill in my 100 square foot workspace. So I'm going to be doing this all with hand tools. Just like they did in the Copper Age. Use a fresher hacksaw blade than I did. Save yourself three minutes. Filing, filing, filing. I've measured the angle on the bottom of the nut and I'll transfer that to the blank with a little scribe. 
filing, filing, filing. I don't have any machinists blue die chem, so I'm using Sharpie. I'll go back and check this angle. And it needs some more coming off the trailing edge. This is draw filing. Moving the file sideways produces a very fine finish. Also lets me kind of sneak up on things. I know it's um, fairly flat right now, so I want to maintain sort of these parallel lines. It's about eh, half a millimeter too wide. At this point everything is basically the same as doing a, a standard nut in bone or plastic. We'll scribe the line off the top of the frets. And you can see there's quite a bit of material to take off. I might um, use my Veritas power sander to help hog through some of that. I think filing might actually be faster. A little less hot on the fingertips too. I've marked out the spacing for the string slots and I'm using a scalpel blade here as a scribe. You really need the starting point in this brass because if you didn't the file would just skate all over and there would be no accuracy. And I'll use a razor saw to deepen those marks. And then standard nut files. These are all still too high. So I'm going to reduce the height of the base string until it's uh, 22 thousandths of an inch above the first fret, which is just over half a millimeter. I didn't mention it, but these are big chunky strings. This is a 52. Yeah, that's just about right. 22 thousandths. Oh, I wouldn't want to do this every day. I think it takes about three times as long as a standard nut. I'm taking down the excess, and I can sight down the front edge of the nut here and see the depths of the slots, and I can basically gauge. I want uh, about half the string diameter in the slot, except for the um, high E and B strings. I go a little bit deeper there to shape the edges and the corners. Sanding. It's a question of how fine to go. Uh, this stuff tends to show every little scratch, ding, and dent. So I'm not going to go crazy and make it shine like a silver plate or something. Um, I'll take it up to the micro mesh, maybe 3600, 4000. So it'll be shiny, but uh, won't be too disappointing when the inevitable scratches start forming. I'll also use a small round file to relieve the exit point of the string on the back of the nut a little bit. Um, this will help prevent it from binding. And there we go. One brass nut. I would say if you want one of these that you should probably expect to pay a premium because they do take much longer. A lot of effort involved. But, you know, they hold the strings. So, we can do a non-scientific qualitative test. I'll save the same strings, we'll put them on again and see what it sounds like, if there's a real difference. I can't remember what I played. That was two and a half hours ago. Brassy.